One day, Eve was walking around in the garden. Wasn't expecting anything special that particular day. Maybe she was admiring the trees and the beauty of this garden that God had planted for her and Adam to enjoy. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she sees a snake. And you notice she's not afraid of this snake. She doesn't run from this snake. She doesn't hide from this snake as I would probably do if I saw a snake today. And I want to challenge the picture in your mind of this event because we've been trained to think a certain way by the artists that we have watched. A lot of times they have the snake without legs in a tree as this snake is talking to Eve. But the snake had legs at this particular point, so it could have been that the snake was standing on the ground having this conversation with Eve. So not only is she not afraid when she sees the snake, She is not in any way startled when the snake starts talking to her. And the snake asked her a question. And the question was, has God said you're not allowed to eat from all of these trees? And she responds to the snake. She says, no, God says that we're able to eat of all of these trees except one tree. We're not allowed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God has said, in the day that we eat from that tree, we will die. Not only can't we eat of it, we're not allowed to touch that tree. And so Satan, in the form of this serpent, says to her, Eve, Eve, Eve. God has this story all wrong. See, God is trying to pull one over on you. God just knows in the day that you eat of that fruit that you're going to know the difference between good and evil. You yourself will be like God. Don't you want to be like God, Eve? She looks at the tree. And she sees that it is desirable. And that fruit looks like it's real tasty. And you can sort of see maybe the the wheels turning in her mind as she looks at that fruit and says, maybe that's the best fruit in this whole garden. You know, the other fruit has been been good. Maybe I should just take that fruit and I should eat it and I will be like God. I'll know the difference between good and evil. And so she does. I don't know where Adam is, is the second she eats it, but it doesn't take long for her to find him. And she gives him the fruit, and he eats of the fruit, and both of their eyes are open. And they realize something for the very first time. They realize they don't have any clothes on. And and so they go ahead, and they go get some fig leaves, and they sew these fig leaves together. And then they go, and they hear the sound of God walking in the garden. And instead of going to that sound, which they probably did before, they go away from that sound. And you see them hiding in the bushes as they hide from God. And God calls out to them, Adam, Adam, where are you? And I just sort of visualize him sheepishly coming out from behind some kind of a bush. And whether or not Eve follows him at that particular moment or not, I don't know. But then he says to God, I was afraid when I heard your voice. So I knew that I was naked and I was ashamed. And so I hid myself. Adam, did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Yes, Lord, I did, but she gave it to me. My wife, the one that you gave me to be my wife, she gave it to me, and I ate. Eve, what have you done? It was the serpent. The serpent talked to me, and he deceived me, and he gave me the fruit, and I ate. Now, when it comes down to the time to talk to Satan, Satan had nowhere to hide because this was his plan to begin with. And so God is going to announce curses on Adam, on Eve, on the snake, and on Satan himself. What we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to sort of go to the beginning. 
and look at stories from the beginning. Just sort of refresh our minds of some of these amazing stories where Jesus was present, where that lamb was present, and that lamb knew exactly what was taking place and where this particular story was going to end. And so I do like this idea, this concept that Brian noted a little bit earlier today of looking of what life was like in heaven. Now, we're going to be very careful because we don't know what Jesus was thinking. We don't know all the things that were going through his mind at any particular time in history. But we do know a lot of things. We know that he was there and we know that he was present. And so we're going to maybe wonder a little bit about what that was like, but we're going to focus on the facts that these things did take place, and God is really letting us know all through history. It's wonderful and great and awesome that God gives us a book like Revelation that says, hey, there is victory, and there is going to be future victory. But all these little tidbits all along the way was, you know, God telling Satan, you're not going to win. It might look like you're winning right now, but you're not going to win. And how what a wonderful blessing that was through all the people in history who heard these stories, and they were reminded. They didn't have the whole story, but they were constantly be re being reminded by all these stories we have in Scripture, Satan's not going to win. You stick with God, you'll win. You go to Satan, you're not going to win. And so a lot of these stories tell us that from the very beginning. And those are very, very important things for us to look at and us to consider. Because when Jesus finally does come to this earth, there is a story in the, in the New Testament where a man named Simeon is holding Jesus in his arms. And I imagine him looking at Jesus, and he says, Now I can die in peace because I have seen God's salvation. Jesus was what all the stories in the Old Testament were looking forward to. They were all pointing to him. The story of Adam and Eve's sin is recorded to us in the Bible. It points to the lamb. It points to the one who overcomes. And God lets us know that all, from the very beginning, that this is what is going to happen. And I think knowing all those stories and looking at them from Jesus' perspective will help us see the stories in a different way and maybe give us a, a deeper understanding of these stories and something to ponder this week and the next few weeks as we go on. Then what's going to happen, hopefully, Lord willing, we will get to the birth of Jesus on December 26th. All these stories are going to lead to the birth of Jesus, and we're going to tell that story on December 26th. Now, I realize Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. I understand that, and I get that. And, but I also understand that a lot of people are going to be thinking about the birth of Jesus. And we don't always have to lead with, you know, that's not Jesus' birthday, you know. <laughs> we can sometimes talk about, you know what, the story of Jesus' birth is an amazing story. And I, let's talk about the story of Jesus' birth, and you might be able to tell them what we're talking about for the next six weeks are stories that you really have to hear and know before you can fully grasp why everybody was waiting for Jesus. And so it gives them some better, you want to better understand the story of Christmas? You want to better understand the story of the birth of Jesus? Well, I'll take you to a website, and you can look at some lessons and some ser sermons that are going to help you understand that story even better. And hopefully that will be uh, something that you can use as you're talking to your friends, and they will be able to understand the story of Jesus so much better if they just understand some stories in the Old Testament. Just by way of housekeeping, I don't think you guys know this yet, but Brian's teaching all of Revelation. So we, we, we sort of just came to the conclusion at the same time that it would probably be better for consistently, consistency's sake if only one of us taught the book. And as he opened up his uh, lesson so brilliantly this morning that he had been waiting for this, or you've been waiting for this for five years, he's sort of been waiting for this for five years too. So he is going to be teaching all of the, the classes on Revelation, and I'm going to be preaching for the next six weeks straight. So that gives me a chance to build some sermons on top of each other and get us to that point in December 26th where we can look at the birth of Jesus. 
notes. I think it'll be helpful to you. And they're not aligned perfectly like we normally do, but they are sort of aligned that we're starting with Jesus at the beginning. We're looking at Jesus all the way through, and of course we're going to be looking at the Lamb as we go forward. If we're not looking for Jesus in the Old Testament, we're not going to find him. If we're looking for him in the Old Testament, we're going to see him on every single page. And so that's what we want to do. We want to look for Jesus and see him on every single page. There's three things we're going to look at today. First of all, we're going to look at Jesus actually is the one that created the garden and everything in it. If, you, if you're looking at this from an idea of a play, Jesus is not only going to be a, the significant character in the play. Now, this isn't a play. This isn't fake. This is real, right? But Jesus is also going to be the one that builds the set. Usually what you have in the, in the real world of big plays is you have a group of people that will come in and build the sets. And they're different from the ones who are actually writing the play or the one who are actually acting in the play. We see Jesus is all of that. Jesus is the one that is going to build the set that he's going to live in. And he's going to be the one that is the ultimate character, the ultimate true character that comes into the world to take care of sin. And then we're going to look at Adam and Eve's sin in more detail. And then third, we're going to look at how their sin affected Jesus. So it's good to be here today and worshiping with you at the Palm Springs Drive Church of Christ, where we do worship God, we study His Word, we love one another, we reach out to the lost as we all try to grow to God's glory. That's what we're trying to do here today, and we're glad that everybody's been able to join us. So let's go ahead and look at our very first point. But before we go back to the book of Genesis, look at this verse in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 18, because it gives us this idea very succinctly that Jesus was part of creation. Jesus created everything. And so let's read it. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So a couple of very important things there. First of all, everything in the world was created by Jesus. Nothing that we see out in nature wasn't created without Jesus. He had his hand in all of creation. So when you go to the mountains and look at the mountains, Jesus was present when those were created. He is the one that created all those things. It's very important for us to know, especially as we start looking at this very first story in the Bible. The second thing that we learn from this is through him all things consist and consist in him. So they're held together. They continue to exist because of Jesus Christ. So nothing that was created was created apart from him. He created all things and everything is held together and continue to exist because of Jesus Christ. That's how important he is in this story that we have for us. So let's turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and let's start in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 with the creation of Adam and Eve. Then God said, let us. We've sang about, and, and, and Brian's mentioned, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is the first indication where we get where Jesus, the Son, was present in the beginning and was the one that created all things. Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We're looking at this through Jesus' perspective. Before Jesus created man on day six, he created the snake that Satan used to tempt Eve. Now, I don't know what, if Jesus was thinking, oh, Satan's going to use this, but he knew he, he was there in the beginning, and he knew, and he was part of the ones that created the snake. Jesus created Adam and Eve in his image. In the bulletin article, I, I deal a little bit more with that, but could you imagine 
just putting yourself there as an observer. And here the father is shaping dirt into the form of a man and the son knowing that he's going to take on a body shaped out of that dirt one day. He will live in a body shaped out of dirt that is being created right then and there. And how interested he was in all of this and how he was a part of all of this. And then there's this. Jesus was an active participant in giving Adam free will. I don't know about you, but there have been times where I wished my kids didn't have free will. (laughs) And it didn't take long before I started wishing that, you know, and they get to two years old and they start exercising that free will a little bit. You say, man, I wish I could, if I could just take that free will away from them until they're 25 and then give it back to them, that would be wonderful. Uh, We knew we couldn't do that when we had kids, but here Jesus is with God in the beginning, allowing man to have free will knowing very well what that's going to mean. It is going to mean that there's going to be suffering on this earth. It is going to mean that there are going to be people who reject God. It is going to mean all kinds of things. And Jesus knew all of that when he and God the Father and the Holy Spirit decided to give it to us. That's amazing to me. That he was in the beginning, knew about free will, knew what free will would cost him, and did it anyway. Go back from day six, back to day three. So we're going to go up to verse 11 of chapter one. Genesis chapter one and verse 11. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb and yield seeds and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And so it was And the earth brought forth grass and the herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. On day three, Jesus created all the trees in the garden. Jesus created the tree of life, and Jesus created the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you think about that for a second, that's going to have huge ramifications in this story. And if you think about the idea that Jesus created trees, and as we look at the consequences of sin, he's going to be nailed to one one day. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, The Bible says this, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So not only did he create All the individual trees, he put them in a garden in order for Adam and Eve to tend it. Think about this as we noted earlier about Jesus. What he's doing is he is setting the stage. He's building the stage for everything that's going to happen later. Himself making this. Go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. And think about this from the son's perspective. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. Let's stop there for a second. Isn't this a lot different than either, even Eve remembers it and how Satan twists it? You notice there's nothing here about not being able to touch it, right? That was something that either God communicated some other way, something that's left out of this text, or something that Adam got from God, or he just told Eve, hey, this is what, don't even touch that tree. I mean, God says don't eat of it, but I'm saying we're not even going to touch it. We're going to stay totally away from that tree because we don't want to have anything to do with the consequences that God said were going to be as a result of that tree. But look at what God says. Of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. 
So there's this idea of the trees were meant to be a blessing. And all the trees that God gave to eat from, these were blessings. And then he says in the very next verse, verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Jesus was there when Adam was given the command by God not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So you see how seeing, I think seeing this story from Jesus' perspective adds a depth to it that will give us a lot better understanding and appreciation for Jesus. So let's look at the actual sin itself. And as we start there, I want to go back to Psalm 139 and verse 7. Psalm 139 and verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. Now, here's the point I want to make from this verse. David understood something that maybe Adam didn't, and maybe sometimes we don't understand. God was aware of the sin when it was happening. Jesus was aware of the sin when it was happening. So just imagine Jesus seeing this unfold, seeing the creation that he gave free will to, succumbing to a temptation from Satan that was using a snake he created and fruit that he created, knowing what was going to happen next and what that was going to lead to. It's sort of reminiscent to me about when, uh, when the children of Israel build the golden calf. Moses and God are on the mountain. God knows what they're doing down there, right? And he's, he's, he just abruptly stops what he's doing with Moses and says, get out of here. And, you know, the people have done something bad there, and you go down and you, you go straighten that out. Your people have done that. So I just want to make us understand, we'll come back to this again at the end, God and Jesus both know that we're sinning in real time. And they both knew what Adam and Eve were doing in real time. God knows everything. And Jesus knew the importance of this encounter between Adam and Eve and the serpent. Now go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. This is after the sin. Or at the beginning of the sin, we'll look at the consequences as we go. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Jesus, and this is, I know I'm, this might seem like we're making the same point over and over, but I think this is such an important point. Jesus was in the garden when Satan tempted Eve. He knew what that meant. He knew what that sin meant at that moment. He knew that that sin, where it was going to lead. He knew what was going to happen and what was going to be told in the book of Revelation. He knew all this as it was happening. In verse 8 of chapter 3, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and Eve and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now here's the, a couple of very important points here. We have a phrase, the truth, the whole truth, and what's the last part of that? 
nothing but the truth. The devil does not specialize in the whole truth. The devil specializes in partial truths. Was it true that her, their eyes would be open and they would know good from evil? That was true. Was it true that they were going to be like God? Yeah, maybe in a very, 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 very limited sense, right? That was false. Look at all the things that Satan left out. And I just have three here. I, I, I encourage you to think about all the things Satan left out. Maybe discuss those in the, in the house to house this week. He didn't tell them that they would feel shame for the very first time. Don't you hate shame? Have you ever felt shame before? It's awful. It's debilitating. I mean, it makes you want to crawl under a blanket and stay there forever. You want to hide yourself in the closet. It is terrible. And he didn't tell them that. But that was going to be one of the consequences of their sin. As a matter of fact, in that first song that we sang this morning, he bore it all. And that last verse, I believe it's the last verse, it says, Up Calvary's hill and shame the blessed Savior trod. You know who else had to bear shame because of that sin? It wasn't just Adam and Eve. Jesus knew that sin was going to lead to him bearing shame. If you recall what it says in, the, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says he despised the shame. That was left out of the entire equation, this idea of feeling shame. So much shame that they had to hide themselves from God. He didn't tell them that they would experience fear for the very first time. I don't like fear either. I mean, I don't like shame. I don't like fear either. And, and I'll be honest to you with you, I hate snakes. I, 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 it's even one that is not dangerous, I still don't like it. I don't want to be around it. I'm not going to go pick it up. I'm not, if you pick it up and come bringing it my way, I'm heading in the other direction. I don't like snakes. I, even if it's not afraid, I'm not afraid they're going to hurt me necessarily. I just don't like them partly, I think, because of this story. I mean, they're just rotten to me. They were cursed. And if God's going to curse a snake, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Okay. I don't know what it says to all the people who love snakes, <laughs> but I don't like them. I want to stay away from them. It was cursed by God. He didn't tell them that they were going to disappoint God. He didn't tell them what effect his son, that their sin was going to have on his son. Satan didn't tell them all that stuff. See, Satan can't tell you the whole truth. Because if they pulled Eve aside and said, Eve, this is the way it is. You can eat of that fruit. You're going to have the knowledge of good and evil. And that's probably going to have more drawbacks than good things about it. And you're going to have shame for the very first time. It's going to be awful. You're going to look at yourself. You're going to want to hide from God. And then you're going to be afraid of things after this. Fear is going to enter into the equation. And then in order to take care of this problem, God's going to have to send his son that was there in creation. He provided all these wonderful things for you. He's going to have to send him to this earth to die to get rid of this sin. Didn't tell her any of that stuff. Satan can't tell us the truth. Satan doesn't tell us the truth about any sin. He didn't tell the truth about sexual morality and say, hey, you know what? Sexual morality, it's going to be pleasurable and your life's going to be wonderful after you commit that. Everybody's going to be happy with you. It's going to be the greatest thing. You're going to get, it's going to, doesn't tell you how it's going to destroy your life. It's going to destroy the life of your wife and your children. It's going to destroy your reputation. You want to talk about shame, you're going to feel ashamed if you do that. Satan doesn't tell you any of that stuff. The commercials on television have all these people drinking, right? And they're partying, and everybody who's ever had a, a beer in their hand is the most beautiful person in the entire world, right? They're just so, all so good looking, and none of them have beer bellies, none, none of that stuff. And it doesn't tell you that, look, if you start down this path of sin, you're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to, there's that scene, several scenes, in one of my favorite movies, Hoosiers. And you remember, if you watched that movie, one of the player's dads a drunk. And he embarrasses that kid over and over and over again in that movie. Satan doesn't tell you any of that stuff. 
Satan doesn't lead with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, let's look at our third point. How does this sin affect Jesus? Genesis 3 and verse 14, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. That was to the snake himself. Verse 15, But I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed, uh, your seed and her seed, capital S, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is what, where God is saying, look, it might look like you, you had a major victory today, and it was a victory to some degree. But I'm telling you one thing, Satan, you're not going to win. When sin entered the earth, it was announced that Christ would also enter the earth. When the problem came, the solution was announced by God. Here's the problem. Here's the sin. I have the solution. Yes, you will bruise the heel of the seed of woman, but he is going to bruise your head. And the consequence of that sin was death. Not only was it the death of Adam and Eve spiritually, not only was it the death of all of us physically, the consequence of that sin was the death of Jesus Christ. You don't think Jesus knew that when God pronounced that at the very beginning? Sure he did. He knew all of this. And yet he still not only came, but he still created. The entire Old Testament is the story of how God was working through Israel to assure the outcome he cursed Satan with on this particular day, to assure victory. It tells us on every page, God is going to be victorious, and it's going to be through the seed of woman. It's going to be through the seed of Abraham. Eventually, he's going to say it's going to be through the seed of David. Don't lose hope. God is going to win. Don't lose hope. The Lamb is on the way. Satan is not told how this would happen. But he did say it would come through the seed of woman. And here's a very important point. The curse on Satan becomes a promise to Abraham and a blessing to us. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. When the time was right, God sent his Son into the world to redeem mankind. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 says this, To the woman he says, or Genesis 3, 16, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, and your, and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Jesus, his mother, was affected by that curse. When Jesus entered this world, his mother was in great pain. Mary even had to watch as her own son was crucified the cost of the sin that Adam and Eve created that Jesus was there and witnessed. Can you imagine witnessing the sin that was eventually going to cause your mother to suffer, not only in childbearing, but also suffer to watch her son die? Genesis 3.17, Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life to Adam. Both thorns and thistles shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. While Jesus walked this earth, he had to work physical labor. He was a carpenter. It wasn't easy. For the first years of his life, he trained with his father. It was hard, hard work. Jesus had to experience the loss of loved ones. I can't tell you that Jesus was thinking about that in the garden when he was creating all this, but I know it's true. I know Jesus was there in the beginning, and I know Jesus suffered by losing Lazarus, by watching that woman cry as her son's being marched out, the widow from Nain, as he stops the coffin, as he hears news that his own cousin has died. I wonder if his mind goes back, ah, that first sin. Look at the consequences of that. Look at how all this is unfolding, knowing that he is the one that's going to make it all turn out in our favor. Well, here's the conclusion. 
Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. Jesus was involved and affected by the great stories we read about in the Bible. In today's story, he is the promise, he was promised by God to bruise Satan's head. As the Bible story continues to unfold, we will gain great insight to the much anticipated day where Jesus entered the earth. And then Revelation is going to take us to the much anticipated day when we are reunited with him in heaven. What I want you to do is I want you to do a few things for me this week. I have some questions in there for house to house. If you don't go to house to house, still review those questions. But I want you to meditate on Jesus and the first few chapters of the Bible. Just think about it this week. Just when you're in the car, when you're driving, when you have some extra time, think about what that would have been like for Jesus. All these events and how this unfolded, and then think about how much he loves us. How does, and then I want you to think about this as well, and how does the fact that God sees us sinning in real time help us stay away from sin? I wish I would have put that in the house-to-house questions, but I didn't. It's one of those things, once you get them all done, you think of another question, it's too late. It's printed out, right? But you just think about that this week. How does the fact that God sees us sinning in real time keep us from sinning? And then I want you to tell one friend, one person, if you can. I don't know, it may be somebody you don't even know. Somebody, you go to the convenience store every single day. Maybe tell one person, you know what? I want you to go and look at some of these sermons that we have online, invite one person, one person to hear the stories in the Bible that will lead to the birth of Jesus Christ. Just one person. Hopefully it's a non-Christian. Hopefully it's somebody you know from work or somebody that you're associated with in your community. Just invite them to hear some of these stories. God wins. It's not just the story of the book of Revelation. It is the story of the entire Bible. God's people win. That's the story of the entire Bible. I want to be one of those people. I want you to be one of those people. I want you to be victorious. So if you're sitting in the audience this morning, or if you're watching online, and you are not a child of God, and if your sins have not been washed away by that lamb that was slain for you, and if you have not been immersed in water to get rid of those sins, don't wait. Grab victory. Be one of God's children. Do it today. And if you're a Christian, if you in any way are walking away from God because you're ashamed... And you're hiding from him because you know you've sinned and you're afraid he might find out. He knows. He wants to forgive you. Come back to him. He will forgive you and you will be cleansed from your sins. Nobody needs to leave the building today without being victorious through Jesus Christ. If we can help, we ask you to come as we stand and sing.